UNET's downsampling path. This is called the downsampling path look like. Ours is just a ResNet 34. Um, so you can see it here, learn.summary, right? This is literally a ResNet <coughs> 34. So you can see that the size keeps halving, channels keep going up, um, and so forth, okay? So eventually, you've got down to a point where if you use a unit architecture, it's 28 by 28 um, with 1,024 channels. With the ResNet architecture, it, with a 224 pixel input, it would be um, 512 channels by 7 by 7. So it's a pretty small grid size on this feature map. Somehow, we've got to end up with something which is the same size as our original picture. So how do we do that? How do you do computation which increases the grid size? Well, we don't, we don't have a way to do that in our current bag of tricks. We can use a stride one conv to do computation and keeps grid size, or a stride two conv to do computation and halve the grid size. So how do we double the grid size? We do a stride half conv, also known as a deconvolution, also known as a transposed convolution. There is a fantastic paper called A Guide to Convolution Arithmetic for Deep Learning that shows a great picture of exactly what does a three by three kernel stride half conv look like. And it's literally this. If you have a two by two input, so the blue squares are the two by two input, you add not only two pixels of padding all around the outside, but you also add a pixel of padding between every pixel. And so now if we put this three by three kernel here and then here and then here, you see how the three by three kernel is just moving across it in the usual way? You will end up going from a two by two output to a five by five output. So if you only added one pixel of padding around the outside, you would add up, end up with a three by three output. Right? So, uh, sorry, four by four. Um, so this is how you can increase the resolution. Um, this was the way people did it until maybe a year or two ago. Uh, it's another trick for improving things you find online, because this is actually a dumb way to do it. And it's kind of obvious it's a dumb way to do it for a couple of reasons. One is that, like, have a look at this. Nearly all of those pixels are white. They're, they're nearly all zeros. So, like, what a waste. What a waste of time. What a waste of computation. There's just nothing going on there. Um, also, this one, uh, when you get down to, like, um, that 3x3 three three area, two out of the nine pixels are non-white, but this one, one out of the nine are non-white. So they're kind of like, there's different amounts of information going into different parts of your convolution. So like, it just doesn't make any sense um, to kind of throw away information like this and to kind of do all this unnecessary computation and have different parts of the convolution having access to different amounts of information. Um, so um, what people generally do nowadays is something really simple, which is if you have a, let's say a two by two input uh, with these are your pixel values, A, A, B, C, and D, and you want to create a four by four, why not just do this? A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 D, 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 D. So I've now upscaled from two by two to four by four. I haven't done any interesting computation, but now on top of that, I could just do a stride one convolution, and now I have done some computation, right? So an up sample, this is called um, nearest neighbor interpolation, nearest neighbor interpolation. So you can just do, and that's super fast, which is nice. So you can do a nearest neighbor interpolation, and then a stride one conv, and now you've got some computation, which is actually kind of using, you know, there's no zeros here. This is kind of nice because it gets a mixture of A's and B's, which is kind of what you would want, and so forth. 
Um, another approach is instead of using nearest neighbor interpolation, you can use bilinear interpolation, which basically means instead of copying A to all of those different cells, you take a kind of a weighted average of the cells around it. So for example, if you were, um, you know, looking at what should go here, you would kind of go like, oh, it's about three A's, two C's, one D, and two B's, and you kind of take the average. Not exactly, but roughly, just a weighted average. Bilinear interpolation you'll find in any, you know, all over the place, it's a pretty standard technique. Um, Any time you look at a picture on your computer screen and change its size, it's doing bilinear interpolation. So you can do that, and then a stride one conv. Um, so that was what people were using, well, that's what people still tend to use. Um, that's as much as I'm gonna teach you um, this part. In part two, we'll actually learn what the fast AI library is actually doing uh, behind the scenes, which is something called a pixel shuffle, uh, also known as sub-pixel convolutions. It's got not dramatically more complex, but complex enough that I won't cover it today. It's the same basic idea. All of these things is something which is basically letting us do a convolution that ends up with something that's twice the size. And so that gives us our upsampling path, right? So that lets us go from 28 by 28 to 54 by 54 and keep on doubling the size. So that's good. Um, and that was, that was it until UNET came along. That's what people did. And it didn't work real well, which is not surprising, because like in this 28 by 28 feature map, how the hell is it gonna have enough information to reconstruct a 572 by 572 output space? You know, that's a really tough ask. So you tended to end up with these things that lacked fine detail. Um, so, um, what um, Olaf Ronneberger and uh, et al. did um, was they said, hey, let's add a skip connection, an identity connection. And amazingly enough, this was before ResNets existed. So this was like a really big leap, really impressive. And so, but rather than adding a skip connection that skipped every two convolutions, they added skip connections where these gray lines are. In other words, they added a skip connection from the same part of the downsampling path to the same sized bit in the upsampling path. And they didn't add, that's why you can see the white and the blue next to each other, they didn't add, they concatenated. So basically these are like dense blocks, right? But the skip connections are skipping over larger and larger amounts of the architecture um, so that over here, you've literally got, well, nearly, the input pixels themselves coming into the computation of these last couple of layers. And so that's gonna make it super handy for resolving the fine details in these segmentation tasks, because you've like literally got all of the fine details. On the downside, you don't have very many layers of computation going on here, just four, right? So you better hope that by that stage, you've done all the computation necessary to figure out is this a bicyclist or is this a pedestrian? But you can then add on top of that something saying like is this, you know, is this exact pixel where their nose finishes or is that the start of, of the tree? So that works out really well. Um, and that's a UNET. So this is the UNET code from FastAI. And the key thing that comes in is the encoder. The encoder refers to that part. In other words, in our case, a ResNet 34. Um, in most cases, they have this specific older style architecture. But like I said, replace any older style architecture bits with ResNet bits and life improves, particularly if they're pre-trained. So that certainly happened for us. So we start with our encoder. So our layers of our UNet is an encoder, then batch norm, then ReLU, and then middle conv, which is just conv layer, comma, conv layer. Remember, conv layer is a, a conv ReLU batch norm in FastAI. And so the middle conv is these two extra steps here at the bottom. Okay, just doing a little bit of computation. Little, you know, you, it's kind of nice to add more layers of computation where you can. 
So encode a batch norm ReLU and then two convolutions. And then we enumerate through um, these indexes. What are these indexes? I haven't included the code, but these are basically, we figure out what is the layer number where each of these stride two comms occurs, and we just store it in an array of indexes. So then you, we can loop through that, and we can basically say for each one of those points, create a unit block, telling us how many upsampling channels there are and how many cross connection. These, um, these things here are called cross connections, or at least that's what I call them. Um, so um, that's really the main works going on in the, in the unit block. Um, as I said, there's quite a few tweaks we do, as well as the fact we use a much better encoder. We also use some tweaks in all of our app sampling using this pixel shuffle. We use another tweak called ICNR. Um, and then another tweak, which I just did in the last week, is to not just take the result of the convolutions and pass it across, but we actually grab the input pixels and make them another cross connection. That's what this last cross is here. You can see we're literally appending a res block with the original um, inputs. So you can see our merge layer. Um, so really all the work's going on in UNet block. And UNet block is, um, it has to store the, the uh, activations at each of these downsampling points. And um, the way to do that, as we learned in the last lesson, is with hooks. So we, we put hooks into the ResNet 34 to store the activations each time there's a um, stride 2 conv. And so that's, you can see here, we, we grab the hook. Okay. And um, we grab the result of the, the, the stored value in that hook, and we literally just go torch.cat, so we concatenate um, um, the uh, upsampled uh, um, convolution with the result of the hook, which we chuck through batch norm, and then we do two convolutions to it. And actually, you know, something you could play with at home is pretty obvious here. Anytime you see two convolutions like this, there's an obvious question is, what if we used a ResNet block instead? So you could try replacing those two comms with a ResNet block. You might find you get even better results. Now, they're the kind of things I look for when I look at an architecture is like, oh, two comms in a row, probably should be a ResNet block. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's UNET, um, and you know, it's amazing to think, you know, it preceded ResNet, it preceded DenseNet. Um, it's been, it, it wasn't even published in a major machine learning um, venue. It was actually published in MICI, which is a specialized medical image computing conference. Um, for years, actually, you know, it was largely unknown outside of the medical imaging community. And actually what happened was um, Kaggle competitions for segmentation kept on being um, easily won by people using UNETs. And that was the first time I saw it getting noticed outside the medical imaging community. And then gradually a few people in the academic machine learning community started noticing and now everybody loves UNET, which I'm glad because it's just, it's just awesome. Um, so yeah, so uh, identity connections, regardless of whether they're a plus style or a concat style, are incredibly useful. Um, they can basically get us close to the state of the art on lots of important tasks. Um, so I want to use them on um, another task now. And so the next task I want to look at is um, image restoration. So image restoration refers to um, starting with an image. And this time we're not going to create a segmentation mask, but we're going to try and create a, a better image. And there's lots of kind of versions of better, there could be different image. So the kind of things we can do with this kind of image generation would be take a low res image, make it high res, take a black and white image, make it color, take an image where something's been cut out of it and try and replace the cut out thing, uh, take a photo and try and turn it into what looks like a line drawing, take a photo and try and make it look like a Monet painting. These are all examples of kind of image to image generation tasks which you'll know how to do um, after this part of the class. So in our case, we're going to um, try to do image restoration, which is going to start with low resolution, poor quality JPEGs with writing written over the top of them, 
and get them to replace them with high resolution, good quality pictures in which the, the, the text has been removed. Yeah. Two questions? Okay, let's go. Why do you concat before calling conf2, conf1, not after? Um, because if you did conf1, con, you know, if you did your conf before you concat, then there's no way for the channels of the two parts to interact with each other. You don't get any, you know, so remember in a 2D conf, it's really 3D, right? It's moving across two dimensions, but in each case, it's doing a dot product of all three dimensions of a rank three tensor, row by column by channel. So generally speaking, we want as much interaction as possible. We want to say, um, you know, this part of the downsampling path and this part of the upsampling path, if you look at the combination of them, you find these interesting things. So generally, um, you know, you, you want to have as many interactions going on as possible in each computation that you do. How does concatenating every layer together in a dense net work when the size of the image feature maps is changing through the layers? Uh, that's a great question. So if you have a stride two conv, you can't keep dense netting, right? So um, that's what actually happens in a dense net, is you kind of go like dense block growing, dense block growing, dense block growing, so you're getting more and more channels, and then you do a stride two conv without a dense block, and so now it's kind of gone. And then you just do a few more dense blocks, and then it's gone. So in, in practice, a dense block doesn't actually keep all the information all the way through, but it just every, up until every one of these um, stride two confs. Um, and there's kind of various ways of doing these bottlenecking layers where you're basically um, saying, hey, let's, let's reset. Um, it also helps us keep memory under control because at that point we can decide how many channels we actually want. Good questions. Thank you. Right. So um, uh, in order to create something which can turn um, crappy images into nice images, um, we need a data set containing um, nice versions of images and crappy versions of the same images. So the easiest way to do that is to start with the nice images and crapify them. And so the way to crapify them is to create a function called crapify, which contains your crapification logic. So um, my crapification logic, you can pick your own, uh, is that I open up my nice image, I resize it to be really small, 96 by 96 pixels, um, with bilinear interpolation. Uh, I then pick a random number between 10 and 70. Uh, I draw that number into my image at some random location. Uh, and then I save that image with a JPEG quality of that random number. And a JPEG quality of 10 is like absolute rubbish. Uh, a jQuery quality of 70 is not bad at all, okay? So I end up with uh, high quality images, low quality images that look uh, something like these. And so you can see this one, you know, there's the image, and this is after transformation, so that's why it's been flipped. And you won't always see the image because we're um, zooming into them, so a lot of the time the image is cropped out. Um, so yeah, it's trying to figure out how to take this incredibly JPEG artifacty thing with, with text written over the top and turn it into, into this. So I'm using the um, Oxford Pets data set again, the same one we used in lesson one. Um, so there's nothing more high quality than pictures of dogs and cats. I think we can all agree with that. Um, uh, the crapification process can take a while, but uh, FastAI has a function called parallel. And if you pass parallel a function name and a list of things to run that function on, it will run that function on them all in parallel. Um, so this actually can run pretty quickly. Um, the way you write this function is where you get to do all the interesting stuff in this assignment. Try and think of an interesting crapification which does something that you want to do, right? So if you want to, you know, colorize black and white images, you would replace it with black and white. 
if you want something which can, you know, take like large cut out blocks of image and replace them with kind of hallucinated image, you know, add a big black box to these. Um, if you want something which can kind of take old family photo scans that have been like folded up and have crinkles in, try and find a way of like adding dust prints and crinkles and so forth, right? And anything that you don't include in Crapify, your model won't learn to fix because every time it sees that in your photos, the input and output will be the same. So it won't consider that to be something worthy of fixing. Okay, so, um, so we now want to create a model which can take an input uh, photo that looks like that and output something that looks like that. Um, so obviously what we want to do is use a unit because we already know that units can do exactly that kind of thing and we just need to pass the unit um, uh, that data, okay? So our data is just literally the file names of each of those, from each of those two folders. Um, do some transforms, data bunch, normalize. Um, we'll use ImageNet stats because we're going to use a pre-trained model. Why are we using a pre-trained model? Well, because like if you're going to get rid of this 46, you need to know what probably was there. And to know what probably was there, you need to know what this is a picture of, right? Because otherwise, how can you possibly know what it ought to look like? So, you know, let's use a pre-trained model that knows about these kinds of things. So we create our unit with that data. Uh, the architecture is ResNet 34. Um, these three things are important and interesting and useful, but I'm going to leave them to part two. Okay, for now, you should always include them when you use a, a unit for this kind of um, problem. Um, and so now we're going to, um, and this whole thing I'm calling a generator, okay, it's going to generate. This is generative modeling. We're kind of, I'm not, it's, there's not a really formal definition, but it's basically something where the thing we're outputting is like a real object, in this case, an, an image. It's not just a number. Um, so we're going to create a, uh, a generator learner, uh, which is this unit learner, uh, and then we can fit. We're using MSC loss, right? So in other words, what's the mean squared error between the actual pixel value that it should be and the pixel value that we predicted? Um, MSC loss normally expects um, two vectors. Um, in our case, we have two images. So we have a version called MSC loss flat, which simply flattens out those images into a big long vector. Um, there's, there's never any reason not to use this. Even if you do have a vector, it works fine. If you don't have a vector, it'll also work fine. So we're already, you know, down to 0.05 um, mean squared error on the pixel values, which is not bad after 1 minute 35. Um, like all things in fast AI pretty much, because we're doing transfer learning by default, when you create this, it'll freeze the, um, uh, the pre-trained part. And the pre-trained part of a unit is this part, the downsampling part. That's where the ResNet is. So let's unfreeze that and train a little more. And look at that. So with, uh, you know, three minutes of, four minutes of training, we've got something which is basically doing a perfect job of removing numbers. <clears throat> it's certainly not doing a good job of upsampling, um, but it's definitely doing a nice, you know, sometimes when it removes a number, it maybe leaves a little bit of JPEG artifact, but um, it's certainly doing something pretty useful. And so if all we wanted to do was um, um, kind of watermark removal, we'd be finished. Um, we're not finished. Um, because we actually want this thing to look more like this thing. Um, so how are we going to do that? Um, the problem, the reason that we're not making as much progress with that as we'd like is that our loss function doesn't really describe what we want because actually the, the mean squared error between the pixels of this and this is actually very small, right? If you actually think about it, most of the pixels are very nearly the right color but we're missing the texture of the pillow, and we're missing the eyeballs entirely, pretty much, right? And we're missing the texture of the fur, right? So we want, we want some loss function <clears throat> that does a better job than pixel mean squared error loss of saying, like, is this a good quality picture of this thing? So there's a fairly general way of 
answering that question, and it's something called a um, Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN. And um, a GAN tries to solve this problem by using a loss function which actually calls another model. And let me describe it to you. So we've got our crappy image, right? And we've already created a generator. It's not a great one, but it's not terrible, right? And that's creating predictions, um, like, like this. Um, we have a high-res image, like that, and we can compare the high-res image to the prediction with, <coughs> with pixel MSE. Okay. We could also train another model, which we would variably call, variously call either the discriminator or the critic, they both mean the same thing, um, I'll call it a critic. We could try and build a binary classification model that takes all the pairs of the generated image and the real high-res image and tries to classify, learn to classify, which is which. You know, so look at some picture and say like, hey, what do you think? Is that a high-res cat or is that a generated cat? How about this one? Is that a high-res cat or a generated cat? So just a regular standard binary cross-entropy classifier. So we know how to do that already. So if we had one of those, we could now train, we could fine-tune the generator, and rather than using pixel MSE as the loss, the loss could be how good are we at fooling the critic? So can we create generated images that the critic thinks are real? So that would be a very good plan, right? Because if it can do that, if, it could, if the loss function is am I fooling the critic, right, then it's going to learn to create images which the critic can't tell whether they're real or fake. So we could do that for a while, train a few batches, um, but the critic isn't that great. The reason the critic is that isn't that great is because it wasn't that hard. Like these images are really shitty, so it's really easy to tell the difference, right? So after we train the generator a little bit more using the critic as the loss function, um, the generator is going to get really good at fooling the critic. So now we're going to stop training the generator and we'll drain the critic some more on these newly generated images. So now that the generator is better, it's now a tougher task for the critic to decide which is real and which is fake, so we'll, gen so we'll train that a little bit more. And then once we've done that, and the critic's now pretty good at recognizing the difference between the better generated images and the originals, we'll, we'll go back and we'll fine tune the generator some more using the better discriminator, the better critic as the loss function. And so we'll just go ping pong, ping pong, backwards and forwards. That's again. Um, well, that's our version of again. Um, I don't know if anybody's written this before. Um, we've, we've created a new version of a GAN, which is kind of a lot like the original GANs, but we have this, this neat trick where we pre-train the generator and we pre-train the critic. Um, I mean, GANs have been kind of in the news a lot. They're a pretty fashionable tool, and if you've seen them, you may have heard that they're a real pain to train. Um, but it turns out, we realized that really most of the pain of training them was at the start. If you don't have a pre-trained generator and you don't have a pre-trained critic, then it's basically the blind leading the blind, right? You're basically like the critics, well, the generator is trying to generate something which fools the critic, but the critic doesn't know anything at all, so it's basically got nothing to do. And then the critic's kind of trying to decide whether the generated images are real or not, and like that's really obvious, so that just does it. And so they kind of like don't go anywhere for ages, and then once they finally start picking up steam, they go along pretty quickly. So, if you can find a way to generate things without using a GAN, like mean squared error pixel loss, and discriminate things without using a GAN, like predict on that first generator, you can make a lot of progress. So let's create the um, critic. So to create just a totally standard fast AI binary classification model, we need two folders. One folder is containing high-res images, one folder containing generated images. We already have the folder with the high-res images, so we just have to save our generated images. So here's a 
teeny tiny bit of code that does that. Um, we're going to create a directory called image gen, pop it into a variable called path gen. Um, we've got a little function called save preds that takes a data loader, and we're going to grab all of the file names, because remember that in an item list, the dot items contains the file names, if it's an image item list. So here's the file, file names in that um, data loader's data set. And so now let's go through each batch of the data loader, and let's grab a batch of predictions for that batch, right? and then reconstruct equals true means it's actually going to create fast AI image objects for each of those, um, each thing in the, in the batch. And so then we'll go through each of those predictions and save them. And the name we'll save it with is the name of the original file, but we're going to pop it into our new directory. So that's it. That's how you save predictions. And so you can see I'm kind of increasingly not just using stuff that's already in the FastAI library, but trying to show you how to write stuff yourself, right? Um, and generally it doesn't require heaps of code to do that. And so if you come back for part two, this is what, you know, part, lots of part two were kind of like, here's how you use things inside the library, and of course, here's how we wrote the library. So we're increasingly writing our own code. Okay, so save those predictions, and then let's just do a pil.image.open on the first one, and yep, there it is. Okay, so there's an example of a generated image. So now I can train a critic in the usual way. Um, it's really annoying to have to restart Jupyter Notebook to refresh your reclaim GPU memory. So one easy way to handle this is if you just set something that you knew was using a lot of GPU to none, like this learner, and then just go gc.collect. That tells Python to do uh, memory garbage collection, and uh, after that, <coughs> you'll generally be fine. Uh, you'll be able to use all of your GPU memory again. Um, if you're using NVIDIA SMI to actually look at your GPU memory, you won't see it clear, because uh, PyTorch still has a kind of allocated cache, but it, it makes it available. Um, so you should find this is how you can avoid restarting your notebook. Okay, so we're going to create our critic. It's just an image item list from folder in the totally usual way. Um, and the classes will be the um, image gen and images. Uh, we'll do a random split because we want to know how well we're doing with the critic to have a validation set. We just label it from folder in the usual way. Add some transforms, data bunch, normalize. So it's a totally standard object classifier. Um, Okay, so we've got a totally standard uh, classifier. Um, so here's what some of it looks like. So here's one from the real images, real images, generated images, generated images. Okay, so that's, it's got to try and figure out which class is which. Um, okay, so we're going to use binary cross entropy as usual. Um, <coughs> however, we're not going to use a ResNet here. And the reason we'll get into in more detail in part two, but basically when you're doing a GAN, you need to be particularly careful that the, um, the generator and the critic can't kind of both push in the same direction and like increase the weights out of control. Um, so we have to use something called spectral normalization to make GANs work nowadays. We'll learn about that in part two. So, if, but anyway, if you say GAN critic, that will give you, FastAI will give you a, a binary classifier suitable for GANs. I strongly suspect we probably can use a ResNet here. We just have to create a pre-trained ResNet with spectral norm. Hope to do that pretty soon. Um, we'll see how we go. But as of now, this is kind of the best approach. There's this thing called GAN critic. Um, a, a GAN critic, um, uses a slightly different way of, of averaging um, the, the different parts of the image when it does the loss. So anytime you're doing a GAN at the moment, you have to wrap your loss function with adaptive loss. Again, we'll look at the details in part two. For now, just know this is what you have to do and it'll work. Um, so other than that slightly odd loss function and that slightly odd architecture, everything else is the same. We can call that to create our critic. 
Um, because we have this slightly different architecture and slightly different loss function, we did a slightly different metric. Um, this is the equivalent GAN version of accuracy, the critics. And then we can train it, and you can see it's 98% accurate um, at recognizing that kind of crappy thing from that kind of nice thing. And of course, we don't see the numbers here anymore, right? Because these are the generated images. The generator already knows how to get rid of those numbers that are written on top. Okay, so um, let's finish up this GAN. Um, now that we have pre-trained the generator,